Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone <coughs> to the November 9th, 2023 meeting of the Burlington Conservation Commission. Uh, this meeting, uh, our hearings of the commission will be held in person at, the, at this location. Members of the public are welcome to attend this in-person meeting. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and our participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting and our hearings will not be suspended or terminated if technical problems interrupt the virtual broadcast, unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific items are encouraged to attend in person versus virtual attendance. Now we'll do the, the uh, roll call. Uh, please say present or yes. Uh, Rob Sheehan? Present. Indra Deb? Present. Bill Boyvin. Present. Sarah Walensky. Present. Ed Turco. Present. Uh, Kent Moffat should be as noted as absent. And Larry Cohen as chair, noted as present. Okay. Uh, the first item of business after calling the meeting to order, I'd like to uh, first thank our vice chair, Bill Boyvin. I'm thanking you, Bill. Oh, sorry. For chairing. Oh, yes. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, uh, I watched the meeting, and I know that the commission was in very capable hands, and thank you very much in my absence. Mm. I'll mention that I was doing some traveling to England. Uh, one thing I did notice in a city that's much, much larger than Boston is two particular things of note. One is they have a subway system with about 12 to 15 lines that all work on time very <laughs> frequently. And the other thing I noted is like every few blocks, there's green space. They have one of the largest share of green spaces for most major cities in the world. It really is very impressive. Anywhere you go, there's, you know, there's ponds and little lakes and, and uh, all kinds of wildlife that you can look at and so forth every few blocks. So it's very, very impressive. Oh, and they also, in addition to the businesses doing recycling in London, I learned, that they also have public recycling. And so along the main thoroughfares, they actually have lined up the various kinds of recycling that if you're just sitting there with a bag lunch or whatever, you can recycle the appropriate things. So it was, cool. it was very, very impressive <coughs> in such a large city. <clears throat> All right, so next, uh, public comment seems to be the next item of business. Uh, this is, uh, if anyone would like a few minutes to comment on something not on the agenda, to bring it to the attention of the commission. All right, the record should show that there was no one present for item two, public comment. Next, we have approval of minutes, uh, October 12, 2023. Okay, we have a copy of those. Anybody have any comments that we need to discuss? Couple, or just couple, editing? A couple of minor corrections, that was it. Anything major? I have to just check spellings on Sarah's name to make sure it's spelled correctly throughout. Do you prefer one L or two? <laughs> <laughs> one would be ideal. Okay. There's so many ways to spell it wrong. Uh, I don't even notice. All right. All right. Well, Bill probably would catch it anyway, I guess. Uh, all right. So is there a motion to approve the minutes of October 12, 2023, please? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, five, zero, and I was absent, so I'll say abstain one. Uh, next, we have the minutes <coughs> of October 26, 2023. Same request. Do we have anything to discuss? Um, were they out? Did I see? I didn't see them. I don't think so. Oh, you didn't see them? Oh, uh, just a day or two ago. <laughs> I know. I only saw one minute for some reason. Well, go ahead. Uh, should we keep going? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, since there's no discussion, uh, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of October 26, 2023? Move. Second. Second. All those in favor? One, two. Abstain. Abstain. Three. Looks like it is uh, four zero two because I wasn't there either. All right. Good. Thank you. All right. So uh, next on our agenda is a request for a certificate of compliance. This is 26 Beacon Street, uh, First Patriot Corporation, DEP file number 122-437. I'll call on John or Eileen. You'll, sorry, what? Call on either you or John. 
Oh, actually, we do have somebody in, uh, who's here to, if, in case you have any questions. John, John will oh, field it. Other than, well, if you, other than you're that. here for that? Yeah. Oh, you can come up then. Yeah. I, I didn't think anyone was here for it. Okay. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself and wow. pull, pull the microphone over to oh, a little bit. Hello, Patrick Bogle from Howard Stein Hudson, uh, representing the applicant. Um, right. I can answer any questions or I have a, a brief description of the project. If anyone wants to kind of delve into a, a brief history of kind of what happened, I guess. Uh, sure, since it's been a while. Yeah, so, so basically um, from 2008 to 2014, the, the, the project went through a f basically a full reskin, um, siding, roofing, windows, et cetera. Uh, there was also some pavement, um, uh, repaving of the roads. And then as part of that, there was um, some, some small amount of work within the buffer, which uh, included um, the, that they wanted uh, a guardrail added along the wetlands on the eastern side. Um, and that was to prevent any snow being pushed off um, into those areas. Uh, additionally, there was, um, there's a central uh, stormwater pond, a wetland pond, that everything, a uh, wet pond that everything drains to. Uh, there's some outlet culverts from that, and as part of the road construction, they, it was kind of a, we'll see what the conditions of those are. The, um, during the, the road construction, everything appeared to be perfectly fine, the culverts were in great shape. Uh, but additionally, in 2013, they did add a small um, catch basin that uh, took some water from a low point and drained it back into where uh, the drainage, the treatment train flowed uh, and how it was supposed to flow for the site. And uh, that was done by Hancock Associates. Uh, other than that, the, uh, the site was walked, I believe, by John and um, a, an associate from my company, uh, Katie Enright. And uh, everything is, is frequently maintained and the property has been uh, operating as as it was approved um, back in 2008, I believe. So, okay, it has been a while. <clears throat> okay, uh, John. All right. So the order of conditions was approved in uh, 20 uh, 2008. Um, the amendment to add that catch basin, so that was an amendment to the order, it was in 2013. Um, there was in addition, there was some other small on-site drainage work. I think um, some yard drains or whatever. Um, but overall, the project wasn't wasn't really big. There was some curb replacement or repair, um, the guardrail, as you mentioned. Um, and the work's all been done a long time ago. I walked it a few months ago. It, it appeared fine. Um, so I'd recommend issuing the certificate of compliance. Are there any outstanding issues that we need to address with this gentleman? All right, uh, Ed uh, or Sarah, anything on this? Nothing to add. All right, uh, all right, Indra, Rob, and Bill. No, nothing. I have nothing further, so I guess we, you don't have to answer any questions. <laughs> uh, so here's what we'll do. Could I have a motion to issue a certificate of compliance for 26 Beacon Street? First Patriot Corporation, DEP file number 122 437. So move. move. Second. Yeah. All right, all in favor? 600. Is there a bond involved? $5,000. And are you recommending full release? Yes. All right, so uh, we'll put a motion on the table. Could I have a motion for full release of the bond for 26 Beacon Street, First Patriot Corporation? DEP number 122-437. So moved. Second? Second. Further discussion at all? Okay, all in favor? Same vote, 600. Thank you so much. We're all set, thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it. Sure thing. All right, next we have a request for a certificate of compliance, six Maud Graham Circle. Michael McLean, is there someone here for that one? I think he's, I think online. he's online. Oh, there he's he is. He's online. Yes, I started remote and didn't read uh, closely enough or I would have been there in person. I apologize for that. You don't have to apologize. You're welcome to do this. So, uh, and we can see you just fine, as a matter of fact. <laughs> all right. So, uh, would you like to say anything at all before we just do the same thing? I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Again, looking for a uh, certificate of compliance for a uh, project that started, I believe, back in 
2020, permit number 328. And I uh, just want to make sure I have all the order of conditions correct. And I know some members of the commission did a walkthrough the other day. So um, just interested to see what you have to say. Thank you. Sure. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Eileen, are you going to take this one? I will. Uh, so as Mr. McLean um, said, this was it was pretty simple. This was for an addition to his uh, existing house in the uh, in the riverfront. Oh, you can't really see it here, but the um, Sandy Brook runs down the uh, sort of left hand side of the house. There is a um, probably intermittent stream uh, that's tributary to that uh, to Sandy Brook that runs through the back of the yard. Um, and there's also wetland associated with the uh, with the streams. Um, so the addition was in riverfront area and in buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland. Um, the addition went up as far as I could tell exactly as um, exactly as permitted. They also have addressed the stormwater from the addition. It's going into I presume underground chambers because it's definitely going underground. Um, uh, I do not have an issue with this project or with the Certificate of Compliance. One thing I just noted though, oh well there's two things. First of all, um, he was asked to put up some shrubs as well uh, for this in, as mitigation for this project. We had said, or he had said, blueberries uh, or something else and he mostly put up arborvitae. So they are, they are there, that's not really what I was going to point out. Um, he also did a determination was that earlier this year, Michael? I'm sorry, for the tree removal? Yeah. Yes, tree yeah. removal. Yes. That was just earlier this year. Um, I just want to point out that he did. Uh, we had it go as a, um, a request for determination of applicability for tree removal. He removed about seven trees, but as part of that, he was asked to replace those seven trees, which he hasn't yet done. I just wanted to check with with Mike, if that's if that's planned for the spring or something, is there a plan he, for when they're going he, in? I didn't want to get into some issues this fall with the, the weird weather patterns. I wanted to wait until the till the springtime. And I believe speaking with John at the site visit out there that he decided to keep them as two separate um, issues between um, you know the end of this permit and and that. But I do plan on planting seven trees in the spring as well. Right. Okay. So separate permits. So I just wanted to check in with them to see what the make 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 sure there was a plan for that one. I don't have any issue with um, you issuing. I'm fine with you issuing a certificate of compliance for this and for returning the bond if that's what you if you see fit. The bond right. was twenty five hundred. All right. And uh, is there any reason to hold the bond for the project as described for the notice of intent? No. That's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, we have a request for certificate, six mod gram circle. Uh, Ed or Sarah, anything else on this? Nothing new. All right, uh, Rob or Indra, anything? Bill, anything? No. I have nothing either. So then why don't we uh, entertain a request for a certificate of compliance for six mod gram circle uh, for Michael McLean. DEP file number 122-649. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? 600. Okay. Now about the bond. You said $2,500. 2500 yes. And everything is stabilized, it seemed. All right. I mean, this. Okay. Uh, so could I have a motion for full release of the bond for $2,500 uh, for six board gram circle? to Michael McLean, DEP file number 122-649. A move. Second. All those in favor. Again, same vote, 600. Mr. McLean, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the assistance. I appreciate it. Have a nice weekend. Same to you, sir. All right, next we have our, another request for certificate of compliance. This is 3 Marjorie Road. This is Kara and Eric Imlach. And I believe we have Mr. Imlach here to join us. Long time no see since yesterday. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself and state your address so we have it for the record, and then we'll take care of it. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, Eric Imlach, 3 Marjorie Road. Sure. And we uh, completed a pool project. 
Right, right. Okay. Uh, did you want to say anything more at this point, sir? Uh, no, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Eileen. Yeah, no, it's me again. Okay. Um, uh, so this is a certificate of compliance for the pool and patio and some landscaping work that occurred at 3 Marjorie Road. Um, this time I remember to also share the, the pictures. So there, down here there's what they called a ditch. So it's a, it's, it's a, there's, there's a little stream back there with some um, associated bordering vegetated wetland. So the, they had proposed to put in the pool and uh, patio, etc. Um, because the shed was actually in the 20 foot no disturb, they, they moved that back out of it at your request and that has been moved. They also put up a post and rail fence. I am actually not sure that they were required to, but they did. So that's a, that's a nice little feature. And I think you even said that's 21 feet away. Yes. To, it's slight extra bit. The only thing I forgot to check yesterday, which I'm just going to ask you about, is um, there was going to be a little swale there where I'm kind of kind of have my cursor. Um, did, did something a little bit of a, a ditch get um, get? There is, yeah, there? there is a ditch there, yes. Yeah. That was, I think, just for some possible overflow runoff uh, towards, towards the wetland. But when we were out there, we also um, found out that the um, underground stormwater chambers, when he was putting them in, discovered that you know, they have enough capacity to actually take the, 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 the back of the house. So he's now also including the back of the house into the stormwater chambers, which is mostly for runoff from the pool and the patio. So you're saying even, so better, even better than planned. A nice little okay. extra for yeah. you. A nice little and extra. And they did put up, they did plant three native trees that are along the side of, there, there they are, one side of the house. Mm -hmm. There are three maples. And uh, Mr. Imlach said there was also another tree that's beside the pool, which I didn't take a picture of because I was right in at the pool. So everything was done as, everything that I saw was done as expected. Great. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did, you did ask for a fence, I'm sorry. I thought it was extra. Okay, any outside, any outstanding issues? I, no. Okay. And that bond was also 2,500. Okay, so let's go around again and see if anybody has anything else. Ed or Sarah, anything? No. No. Nothing, no. All right. Good. Rob or Indra? And now to Bill. Nothing. Good I, job. Looks good. Yeah. I, I'm, if anybody wants to see what a good-looking layout with the pool and the deck and the fencing and you're on your, I'm going to send them to your house. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's very, very well done. Uh, all right. So if there's nothing further, uh, could I have a motion to issue the certificate of compliance for Three Marjorie Road? to Kara and Eric Imlach, DEP phone number, DEP 122-647. Second. 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 All in favor? That's a vote of 6-0-0. And uh, how much is, was the bond for this? 2,500. 2,500. Mm -hmm. And is there any reason to retain it? I don't think so. Nope. Okay, unless someone disagrees, could I have a motion uh, for full release of the bond? Uh, for 3 Marjorie Road, Kara and Eric Imlach, DEP file number 122-647. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? 6-0-0. Good to see you again. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate everyone's help on this. <clears throat> yeah, thanks so much. Have a good evening. Okay, next. Um, we have a request for determination. Does anybody have a copy of that? The notice, I did not get it in all the paperwork. You did get it, but did I? We, we were afraid you'd say that, so we have another one. <laughs> you got a lot of paperwork, so did I get it? It's somewhere there. I, I went through. I went through everything. It's in oh. there. But that's okay. What? It's in there. But okay. You right. do have a lot of paper. Okay, you have an extra. I, one. I, I accept the criticism. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, see if I can give it the Conservation Commission will hold a public meeting during which time. Uh, we'll act upon a request for determination of applicability filed by uh, Rayo Ortega for the proposed construction of a 12 by 20 pool house within the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetative wetlands. The project is located at 47 Cresthaven Drive in Burlington. 
Uh, the Commission will thereafter issue a determination of applicability. The applications being heard pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 131, Section 40, which is the Wetlands Protection Act and Burlington Bylaw Article 14. Uh, and you can get a copy of this application uh, by simply requesting cons at conservation at burlington.org. Someone here for that one? Yes, I am. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. John Luther, but Banano Construction, representing the owners of um, 47 Crest Haven, right. the Ortegas. All right. Okay. Did you want to say anything further at all? We have we we're, we've got the determination to put in a pool. Now they've wanted to add a pool house, so eight feet from the pool, we're going to put a pool house that's the same width as the pool, but 12 feet deep. So very simple addition. Okay, uh, John or Eileen, do you want to have any comments for us? Um, we were several people, a few people were out there yesterday, and I took some photographs so you can see right. see what it looks like. Um, as John Luther described, it's a smallish pool house. It's going to go right beside the pool, and they thought about it after we we after we had, you had already issued the determination. So this is still a good point to do it because they're still they still um, are undergoing construction. So the um, pool would pool house, I'm sorry, would go beside here where I'm just sort of showing you with the, uh, the cursor. There is a wetland behind the fence. Um, the actual construction work is, gonna, is only going to be around about 50 or so feet from the, um, from the wetland. So this, all this soil is going to be pulled back in, presumably, and, and they'll, be, they'll be reseeding. Um, John did ask them some questions about um, the stormwater, the rooftop water on, on the pool house, and I think they were going to build um, a small dry well. Yes, there's um, the sump pumps from the existing house went out through and into the wetlands, so we're going to rectify that and put them into a dry well. And we'll also take the um, downspouts from the new pool house into a dry well and eliminate any excessive runoff. So I don't really have any issue with um, with this project. It's all within the existing yard. Right. right. So can I just say, just for the benefit of the newer members, for if it was an order of conditions that you could do an amendment, a determination of applicability is not amendable. So that's why they had to file for a new request for determination. It's um, you, you simply can't amend a determination right. of applicability. Thank you, John. Uh, all right, so uh, I guess again, I'll start on the right. Ed or Sarah, anything on this? I just wonder how big of a dry well is it, and where is it going to go on this plot? Um, on that picture, it'll probably, it we'll probably put it right next to the, well, see where that pile of dirt is on that next picture over here? Yeah. yeah, right yeah, right under that pile. Um, okay, once we get rid of that, we'll just dig a hole, probably four or five feet deep, fill it full of um, crushed stone, and then just everything will just drain into that. And the old sump pump used to go underground all the way out to the stream? Yeah. And yeah, it's only three years old, so it's not old. But Is yeah, that they, considered a not a legitimate arrangement? I, I personally don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we saw that it went to the fence, and we didn't look beyond the right. fence. I mean, the wetland isn't directly behind the fence, so right. it, it could have discharged short of the wetland. Quite possibly behind the fence. But it's better to infiltrate. Okay. Yeah. Sump but, uh, pumps theoretically are exempt from a bunch of things because it's supposed to be clean water it's usually groundwater but I mean I would always err on the side of putting it into something because you really just don't know right yeah. okay um, Rob anything uh, no and Indra anything uh, Bill no it's quite a project it seems to be well designed and looks like it's moving along well that's, that's quite a pool you put in. Mm. That's just it's a nice pool. It's a very nice pool. Nice little sitting area. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I nice. hope they'll be happy. A nice dog walking platform on the pool. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, all right. No. Uh, if is there, there's no one in the audience for this, I assume? No? <laughs> all right. So I guess we'll have, we probably have a negative draft uh, determination, negative conditional so determination. Just putting it up right now. You're ready for me to share. 
Okay, so John and the homeowners got a copy of this earlier, so there's nothing shocking, hopefully. So, um, as described, the applicant proposed to install a 12 by 20 foot pool house in the existing lawn behind the house. Um, the house would be beside the pool, behind the low retaining wall that is to be built outside the pool patio that was, that was built under a determination earlier this year. The grade of the rest of the yard will not be altered. This is in, within the buffer to bordering vegetated wetland and approximately 45 feet from the BVW. Um, this work is only for the work as we described this evening. Um, it says prior to the beginning construction on site, the exi set, existing sediment barriers shall be inspected by conservation staff. So we'll just take a look uh, just to make sure they're all looking fine. Um, but he shouldn't need any more because it's no, it's no extra soil is being produced, right? Um, all construction or demolition materials can, and excavated soil shall be disposed of off site in a legal manner. There should be no stock piling of, stock piling of soil or other materials within 50 feet of the wetlands. No dewatering without approval of a dewatering plan by the Conservation Department. A dry well shall be installed to handle rooftop runoff. The existing discharge from a sump pump shall be directed in, redirected into the dry well. No tracking of sediments onto roadways, and if tracking occurs, please clean it. No significant filling or grading of the property under this decision, other than what we already other other than what was approved in the previous determination. And then keep, don't dump anything behind the fence into the wetlands. That's basically it. All right. Is there anything more from from the commission? Any further conditions needed? I don't think so. Uh, are you comfortable with what you heard? Because, did you get a draft, or are you need? Yes, to I did. Yeah, I read it. So you're all set. Yes, well, I'm good. Yeah. Okay, because you looked very casual sitting there. So. No, I'm just very comfortable. It's just. <laughs> so, so I just. We're doing well. Okay. All right. So uh, he was comfortable because he had seen it already. Is the point. Okay, so if there's nothing further, then could I have a motion to issue a negative conditional determination as discussed for 47 Crest Haven Drive to uh, Raul Ortega to construct a pool house? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Six zero zero. Uh, I guess that's it. I don't think we need anything else. No, nope, no? that's you're, it. You're all Don't set. Thank you. Issued next Hopefully week. I won't be back. <laughs> <laughs> Not for this one. <laughs> this right. will have to be a whole new determination again. <laughs> be for your next big project. Yeah. I'll you see you then. You, you can you. come back and visit us anytime. How's that? Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Um, oh my God, it's me again. Are we all on right. time? Are we uh, okay next, this? Um, yeah. we, this one is a continued public hearing. It's a, for a notice of intent. It was for 36 Cambridge Street. It's the Salem Five Bank on 36 Cambridge Street. It's to demolish the existing building and construct a new building. DEP file number 122-693. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good, and how are you? Doing well. Um, for the record, Matt Bombasi from Bowler Engineering. We're representing the applicant, Salem Five Bank, who's the owner. Um, it's property as well. Here is John Kaczynski with the bank. Um, I'm representing right, the applicant. Good to see you both. Good to see you. Okay, um, so uh, you're welcome to talk about changes since the last thing. For the record, I'll just say I was not here, but I did watch the previous perfect. thing, so I'm eligible to vote. Cool, excellent. Yeah, I'll just jump right into the changes then. Um, so, we're part of recap. So, so there were a few items we discussed with the commission last time. I think we said they were coming and we'd actually been given a head up, heads up by staff that there were gonna be requests, so, so we talked to them. First and foremost was, was the landscaping. Um, quite a bit more landscaping on the site, not just per the commission's request, but also the planning board had requested some landscaping improvements. Those landscaping improvements include um, five uh, street trees and, and shrubs along the frontage of Cambridge Street, um, quite a bit of interior landscaping within the green space, which is interior to the site, and also along the, the back of the site by a little brook that was actually in our DEP comments was if we could provide some, some kind of native plantings along that area. Um, so so we, we met that request as well. Do I give you a second? I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at you. I had it already. No, no, no problem. I had the, that thing up here and John was laughing at me because I wasn't sharing. Sorry yes. about that. No, There's no, no the problem. Landscaping plan. Yep, right landscaping there. plan. So that, again, interior landscaping, um, street landscaping, which is, was a planning board request, but I think this commission also mentioned as well. And then, like I said, plantings along um, along the back of the site, which is you know closest to the to the resource area, Little Brook. Um, another another item this this commission brought up, which actually I need to do a little bit of research into, to be quite honest, was um, 
the use of non-variant plants. I guess they noticed some of the plant species we had proposed were variants. Um, so, so we did make, meet that request. I believe all the plants on the, on the site are non-variant species with a couple minor exceptions. Um, one, that the plants along the, the front or the trees are, um, they're native, but they're a slight variant. I guess they're, um, they're pin oak, which are a commoner plant, so we didn't want to use um, a plant that would um, impact the overhead wire. So those, those five trees are, are native, but non-variant. And then the seed mix, I believe, is 70% non-variant, but they use the perennial ryegrass just for its durability. So almost all um, non-variant plants, but wanted to note those couple exceptions um, for the commission. Um, the, the other big comment that we discussed at the last hearing was, was stormwater. Um, we have reducing impervious coverage um, and not increasing impervious towards resource areas part of a part of this plan, but I know staff and the, the commission have mentioned, are there any opportunities to just provide any more treatment inside the, the parcel? And quite frankly, we did identify a couple um, on the site plan to the northeast corner of the property and then at the center of the property within that landscaped area, we found two opportunities for, for rain gardens. So as the commission knows, uh, an area planted with, um, with shrubs and grasses in, in a 24-inch in a soil media depth. Um, those rain gardens are designed to collect runoff through a curb break in the parking area. Um, there's a ponding depth in the rain garden for the water quality um, volume to, to, to pond. And then for larger events, there's a, there's a catch basin within it to, to overflow. But all the, the initial runoff will go in and be treated in the rain gardens. Um, John was actually nice enough to take my call earlier today and mentioned um, one of his requests I had forgotten about at the last hearing was the catch basin the existing catch basin at the northeast corner actually just drops straight into the pipe and then out to the brook. Um, we were originally had been using that as an, as an overflow to the rain garden, but um, instead have proposed a, a separate landscape catch basin with a, with a sump and a hood that discharges that catch basin just so there's that, that extra little uh, treatment before it gets into the piping. Um, DEP had requested an O&M plan, so we prepared and submitted that, which includes these stormwater measures. Um, and then John had actually requested updated drainage calcs, which we submitted earlier today. Um, the, the drainage calcs showed a reduction previously. The rain gardens obviously reduce it a little bit more, but um, thought agree it was appropriate just to, to document that. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, is, is there, from your list, is there anything missing at this point? Did he answer the questions that you had? Um, he did. Those were the exact questions that, that we had listed. And as he said, John, he and John had a chat today. It was, um, we need, yes, how did the bioretention area works? New stormwater calcs. Oh, square footage. That was one thing you mentioned. Square footage of existing and proposed impervious. I just wanted that for, to be able to write up the decisions. Status of the drain in the back left, which is exactly what you also just described, because we were very concerned about that one because it's just that open hole right. and it really wasn't clear earlier when we first got the the, the plans right. how, how this was going to work so can I just get a clarification sure. just just so everybody understands yeah. so the one the uh, retention area back here the water comes in through here right correct yeah comes in through here um, the, it overflows in, into this is that correct um, yeah, it'll have a, a 9 to 12 inch ponding depth and it'll overflow into a, a proposed landscape catch basin within the basin and then if, if, if for some reason it overflows even more, it would go down this way, down into the swale, correct? Correct, yeah, that doesn't happen in our 100-year storm model, but let's, let's say a piece of cloth got on top of the catch basin grave. That would be where it would okay. go. And then this one here, it was also difficult to see because, sorry, that's a weird, my um, mouse has gone a weird shape, but the, the, the inlet is right here, right? Correct, that yeah. is, That's where the curb cut is. Correct. So the... Um, uh, the asphalt presumably is going to be pitched towards there, Correct. towards that corner, yep. and then it's going in through here. And this, this again is the outlet, or uh, the overflow, should I say? Sorry. The overflow, and again, that wouldn't be used even in the hundred-year storm event. But just in the event that the catch basin wasn't working for a reason or another, that would be the way it would flow out. But the main outlet is through the catch basin grate and out the pipe. Okay, so the um, asphalt over here and the rooftop runoff are both going into this area now, right? Uh, as currently shown, just the, the paved area is going into the, into the rain garden. The, the, the roof runoff we generally consider clean, so we have that piped out. Is that still going, direct, is that still going to the, the DOT line, or is it? Yes. yes. Right? Correct, oh. yeah. Okay. The DOT line? Oh, sorry. Uh, that, um, the, the, 
It's a drainage line from the, the right away from the from Cambridge Street. It's actually from Cambridge Street, yeah. which is a DOT. Right. So so that's that's what I meant. I'm sorry. The 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 storm drain line from the street. So sure. there's currently a catch basin catch basin system in Cambridge Street that has a pipe that goes into the brook. The current site has a catch basin grate over that pipe where stormwater just goes into that grate and directly basically into the brook to via that pipe. But they fixed that. Right. Right. But right. the but the now well, the proposed the rooftop, rooftop runoff will just go into that pipe. But that'll be clean water. It's pretty clean. Before we go into any other discussion, anybody have a question about drainage on the site? No. I had one. Um, at the front of the site, um, Can you at say the front of the site. At Cambridge Street? No, uh, towards the, uh, the driveway, right Sons, in there. Sons. All that area and the exit of the ramp. All the all the water seems to flow. Is it flowing into the existing catch basin right there in the? It's hard to see, but it's right. yeah. Right. There's an existing catch basin right at the top corner you of the driveway. You can go up there and point. Oh, sure. If you want, Gra right. grab that arrow and point. <laughs> <laughs> right, and we. So that was my question. It does seem like the grading shows it going into that yep. that part of the site going there. Where does that catch basin discharge to? I believe that discharges to to Little Brook. Ultimately. So it does just charge to the brook, and that's an existing catch basin. Is that owned by the property owner? Uh, no, that's that's off premises. Just it's within the access easement, um, just off the property. So does that is that like a two foot sump or a four foot sump? Or you you didn't look at it because it's not part of your project. Uh, I I did look at it. I don't believe it's a four foot sump. I, it, there might be some sump there, but I, I don't think it's a four foot sump for sure. When I looked in there, it looked. Did it look like it needed to be cleaned out? I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> is that your the owner's responsibility of this site? Uh, whose responsibility is that? Um, I'm not sure if there's a formal agreement as far as the the access easement, who maintains what, but um. I'm, the bank. I mean, to start up, I mean, with a new project, I would want everything known to be cleaned out and working. Yep. And that sort of drains part of your site. So is there anything we need to do to ensure that that happens? So I've been, as you know, I've been really, really prodding people to get stormwater maintenance reports in the last couple of years. And I do believe that I have um, that, um, it, this is called Crossroads, right? <laughs> that um, Edens has been doing cleaning of the catch basins in in this site. So I'd have to just look and see what that whether that particular catch basin is on their um, on their list. If that's the case, then it then it is being cleaned now okay. regularly. But it should be cleaned after the construction yeah. for obvious for obvious reasons. Maybe it should be cleaned or checked. So maybe add a condition that. They work together to just do it cleaning after construction. Yeah, something just, to, I just figured that's part of their site, but it's someone else's catch basin. Yeah. And so the, the owner should be responsible, not you, but the owner should be responsible for that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, are there any outstanding, any other outstanding issues I mean, that you know of? Um, no, uh, I don't think so. Unless John has something to, we did have a lot of questions and they were they were answered. But to be honest, they were only really just answered today. There was a lot of to and fro in the last day or two. Right. So about I'm not alternative sure. analysis, are we okay with that? Um, I think we actually determined that they they can they're okay with that one. What was the reason again? So <laughs> they're exempt. Yeah. So it's a it's what it's a riverfront redevelopment project. So the regulations don't require an alternatives analysis. They simply okay. require an improvement in the riverfront area oh, okay. for redevelopment. So this is redevelopment under two different standards, under the wetland uh, riverfront standards and also as stormwater. So both of them are considered redevelopment. So, um, but as far as riverfront goes, no need for an alternative. We're okay on that. Yeah. All right. So let's see if there's anything else. Uh, Ed or Sarah, anything more we need on this? Mm -hmm. It's all covered. I like the rain gardens. That's great. Okay. There was actually one other thing that I brought up that I mean, you, I know you said you'd have to talk to the to the to the bank was the alter the possibility of infiltrating the rooftop runoff. 
Yeah, sh yeah, sure. I did. I did ask John, uh, John, for that. Um, I guess our hopes was that the the commission would find that the the reduction in impervious and some of the rain garden and landscaping improvements were, were a good faith effort. Obviously, there's a little bit of a gray area of how much you can can improve the site. Um, so I know there's a little bit of unknown quality with the soil and a lot of utilities going through there, and and obviously they've made made a lot of improvements from the original project. So um, if the commission would like to discuss them, we'd be happy to. What's but, the percentage decrease in impervious? Um, a little over 10 percent. I think it's 10 to 15 percent. I think it's 17,000 existing, and it's about a 2,600 um, square foot reduction. So I hope my math is right. right. I think I'm in the so part. for the commissioner's comment, John, do you feel it's subject for discussion? Or? I mean, I, th I agree it would probably be difficult with the, the number of underground um, utilities and whatnot. Obviously, they couldn't put it behind the building because there's a drainage easement there. Um, I mean, it, it was just something I wanted to, to take a look at. I mean, if it's not feasible, so be it. They are making a lot of improvements with the stormwater. And could there it is 10% the less garden? impervious service. Pardon? Could, could it just go into the rain garden? It would probably have to be resized then. What, the rain garden is, is rain? unlined. They are unlined, right? They are, I'm sorry? They're not lined. They're not lined, no, yet. So we do get a lot of infiltration through those as well. Um, yeah, I guess I'd, we'd be happy to discharge it that way. I guess my, my thought would be to allow the rain gardens to treat the, the dirty water and let the clean water bypass instead of surcharging them, but I don't think I'd strongly oppose discharging it there if that's what the commission wanted to do. I think you're better off letting the rain garden handle all the dirty, dirty water. water. Yeah, yeah I, I would think. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. So anyway, <laughs> you've heard the discussion. So well, go back to Ed and Sarah. Any comment on any of this? You're all set. No comment. Okay, uh, Rob, uh, Indra, anything more? You're all set. Uh, Bill. One question. Uh, I had suggested that you look at the possibility of heating and cooling via an air source heat pump yep. to be able to eliminate the gas line completely. Did you have a chance to look into that at all, and what was your thinking? Um, I know I mentioned to John, he was actually right outside after the hearing. He was very open to it. Um, I'm not sure how far those discussions are, have gone, but I know he, he loved the idea. Um, I just okay. don't know if it's something we, we fully We haven't gotten into the detailed design. Good. That would be, that would be a, a, I think, an environmental improvement. And you could even, if you, I don't know if you could have what kind of rooftop you have, but put some solar on the roof to help power that. And you, you know, are really saving money in the long run, I think. I, I've had the same uh, discussion with my executive team uh, at the bank, and, and we seem to be heading in that direction. Excellent. I think you might find that you're actually looking at operating and cost savings, particularly if you put some solar panels on. It actually may be a, com a cost winner for you. Yeah. Could even put up a little sign. <laughs> you could put up a sign advertising that you're doing that as well and the right. benefits that your, your building has for the environment. Thank you for doing that. First net zero bank in Burlington. Yeah. And we don't mean financially, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So let's see where we are. We're, uh, uh, okay. So this is a continued public hearing. Uh, are we in a position to consider drafts tonight? No. No? All right. Uh, is there anything? Uh, I don't have any further comment. As This is a hearing, so I should ask, is there anyone in the audience who wants to comment on the Salem Bank proposal to build a new building? No. All right. So is there something uh, we would close an issue at the next meeting? Is there any issue that we they need to respond to prior to that? If not if unless anybody has any issues if everybody's good then this this plan can be the plan that we you know draft the approval for um, they've indicated to me that they're going to the planning board next week and um, they wanted the Commission to give the planning board some direction so the planning board can close their hearing um, so if you're good um, we can draft a decision for the next meeting and I can let the planning board know that that's what's going to happen and that you're they're good with this plan Anybody disagree with that course of action? Is that why we're not closing tonight? Because the planning board might make changes? No, or? we're not closing because we just got all this information okay. today and yeah. just finished reviewing it just at the end of the day. So very good. We were con we were discussing right. it this morning. We were, yeah, yeah, <laughs> all right. So I did not hear any objection. So uh, do you, we'll write a letter to the planning board. Yeah. 
and we'll close an issue at the next meeting and I did not hear of anything further that you need to provide us. Great. So it looks like it's 15. It's all a go. Awesome. Excellent. Thank all you right, so much. So uh, I guess there's nothing further tonight. Uh, thank you both for keeping us company. Oh, to continue? To continue. Oh, could I have a motion to continue uh, the hearing at 36 Cambridge Street, the Salem 5 Bank, DEP file number 122-693, to the meeting of December 14th? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Okay, 600. You're all set. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so the next is a continued public hearing, notice of intent, 168 uh, Middlesex Turnpike for the rear 2nd Avenue, 23 4th Avenue, uh, and it's also at 5254 3rd Avenue. Uh, it's for the Nord Bloom Company. It's the parking lot reconfiguration, <coughs> and it says here the DEP number is pending, and I, and I was absent at the last meeting. I watched the hearing and, and was qualified to vote on this. So we do have a file number, 122-694. Okay. It was tough getting it, apparently. It was a lot of work, <coughs> a lot of work getting it out of the DEP. All right. So uh, would, would you like to introduce yourself and then say anything you'd like? Sure. My name is Drew Gallant from RJ O'Connell & Associates. Um, we presented this public hearing two weeks ago. Um, continued. We've worked with DEP and the commission to resolve comments um, and address all of concerns. This presentation is very similar to the one I presented two weeks ago. So I'll give a brief overview. I'll try to keep it short. Um, the largest change from two weeks ago to today was the addition of a landscape plan, which shows plantings and then additional flood storage calculations, which um, were congruent with some minor grade changes. Is there a particular part of this you want me to be on? Um, we can start here. This is fine. So this is the existing conditions. Right in the center of the screen, there are three islands that f are sort of awkwardly placed and create um, conflict of vehicular traffic, so we're trying to smooth that out to make it safer for drivers. Um, can you jump to the next? Can we get into presentation view? Wouldn't that be bigger? Sure. Uh, Down the bottom there, usually. One of those little icons there. Well, well never mind. Let's just continue. <laughs> might be at the top. Slideshow? Yeah. Oh. That tab. Uh, Just do. Oh no, forget that. Don't leave. Oh don't boy. That. Okay. <clears throat> oh, there you go. Um, can you go back <coughs> to one? Yeah, I will. Sorry. So this shows ex oh, that one right there. Existing conditions are on the top of the screen, and then proposed conditions are on the bottom. This is from the landscape design plan. It is somewhat faded, so it might be difficult to see, but. Basically, we are trying to align the drive aisle from page right to page left to make it very straight in line with parking on either side. Um, additional landscape islands and plantings, mostly on the left side of the screen. That large island will have a few trees and landscape plantings. And then there's a smaller island on the bottom that also has a couple of trees and landscaping. On the right side, there won't be any large trees, but we'll have sod in the disturbed areas from the construction area. Also on the right side is a walkway that is the large part of the project. Um, it's within the 100-year flood zone, which travels from 4th Ave along the parking area left to help people walk from 4th Ave, from the new development across the street, um, and for office walking. Next slide, please. 
This zooms in on the right side with that walkway. Um, not much is changing here, just the walkway, a small retaining wall next to that existing tree to protect the existing tree. And in that same area, which is within the flood zone, we are proposing some grading to account for the flood storage, um, increasing flood storage at each elevation, uh, one foot interval. And the, the next slide shows the left side, um, that large landscape island with a few trees, landscape plantings all along it, another extension, it's somewhat of a T landscape island on the bottom with a couple of trees and landscaping. And then another small adjustment to the landscape island on the bottom right to make it more natural driving um, <coughs> towards the intersection. And then the next slide jumps into, this is our grading and drainage civil site plan. Um, the dashed blue line shows the 100-year flood line. To the right of that line is the flood zone or bordering land subject to flooding. It's difficult to see, but above the walkway, you can see the proposed contours around the small retaining wall. And in that area, we have provided um, compensatory flood storage calculations by foot. On the left side, we are proposing two catch basins with deep sumps for treatment, and they will connect into the existing drainage system, um, which currently has four or five catch basins on the left side, and it directs towards 4th Ave to a larger system. And that is it. The next slide goes back to the overall rendering from the landscape architects. Okay, thank you. Um, John, is this one for you? Okay. Comments, please? Sure. So, um, once again, I'm, the, the, the reason for this filing is because there's work in bordering land subject to flooding floodplain. Um, the floodplain here is kind of weird. It's, it, um, it, it changes in elevation fairly dramatically as you go down 4th Avenue. So, on this site, I think the, just on this site, the elevation goes from 132 to 120. 28 or something like that mm -hmm. um, and um, rather it's also a floodplain that um, we have new draft maps which will probably become effective in 2025 which will take this area out of the floodplain so um, but we're required to use the current map so we're make they, they have to do floodplain compensation um, because that we're we're using the maps as they are um, it's not a lot of filling, it's not a lot of cutting, but they did, um, they, are, they are meeting the performance standards at each increment. So under the Wetlands Protection Act, if you fill between 128 and 129, 100 cubic feet, you have to create 100 cubic feet at that elevation. If you fill in between 129 and 130, you have to, you have to create at least the same amount of storage at each incremental elevation. And they've got, um, I think, four, four different foot um, increments that they've they've done filling and compensation for um, and and they've met the performance standards <clears throat> additionally there's nothing that they're doing um, which will um, block flood flows or, or restrict the flows at all I mean the, the, there's a small wall but it's, it's pretty minor so um, I believe that their proposal meets the performance standards for bordering land subject to flooding okay uh, thank you and I see they, you folks did submit a, a summary table of pre and post uh, flood storage volumes as well. And I think that was requested. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, Ed or Sarah, anything more on this project? It seems like they responded to what was asked for. All right. Uh, Rob? Uh, yeah. I have just one question is um, how much? Um, imperfect area you are converting to landscaping area? Um, the project... Landscaping island you added, right? Sure. Yes. How we much? we are adding some landscape islands. We're also removing a few um, in the center for the dry aisle. So the project results in a net increase of 320 square feet 
of impervious area. It is a small increase. Um, so. Thank you. All right, Bill. I have nothing further. Okay, it looks looks good to me as well. Um, one of the items that I had asked for at the last meeting. Yeah, it just seems like they answered everything. Yep. All right. So uh, this is a hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment on 168 Middlesex Turnpike, some landscaping changes uh, for the Newt Bloom Company? It's a parking lot reconfiguration, DEP file number 122-694. Anyone online or in the audience? The answer is no. All right. So we have some draft documents. Uh, did you get a copy of them? I did. Eileen sent them via email. I reviewed them briefly. Um, well, we're going to review, go through them now, so okay. as well, so you can listen to see if there's anything that you need to ask a question or anything. Great. Uh, John is going. Why don't John or Eileen? Uh, well, apparently the text is bigger on mine, so I will. Um, so uh, this just, just the, the first uh, um, paragraph is a description of the project, how they were going to construct sidewalks, curbing, striping, and new plantings, uh, as was just described. Uh, two catch basins would also be installed. The total area calculated for improvements is about 74,000 square feet, approximately 2,500 of which is in the 1%. Annual chance flood hazard area, also known as bordering land subject to flooding, which is associated with the tributary to Vine Brook, went through the filing history and all the various plan documents. Um, you might just want to check that I got all that we got all the dates correct with, with the updates, you know, that we updated everything correctly. Sure. The proposed work was partly within BLSF, uh, again, a net, net increase of approximately 320 square feet of an impervious area, and the Commission is finding that the proposed flood mitigation meets the performance standards for BLSF as additional storage at each elevation increment foot meets or exceeds current storage volumes. Additionally, there will be no restrictions created that would impede flows of flood, flood water. And again, they're providing two deep sub catch basins uh, and, are can, and are providing 84 cubic feet of flood storage. This goes through the stormwater standards. Um, um, nothing very exciting there. They're providing recharge to the maximum extent practicable. This isn't um, a local or a, it's not a, a critical area either, either and it is a redevelopment project. Um, this will also serve as a permit under Burlington's stormwater control bylaw. And then, oh, sorry. Um, this was mentioned here as being compost tubes at least nine inch in diameter instead of straw wattles, just because they're not very, they're not very solid on, a, on an impervious surface. Okay. And the compost tubes are much easier to, to knock or kick or drive over. Um, proposing a bond uh, in the order of $5,000 because it's a commercial project. And then the order of conditions, uh, we reference the same plans and various um, memos and so on, stormwater report and PowerPoint presentations as well. Uh, the first few um, conditions are completely standard and uh, everybody has, Drew, Drew in fact has probably seen these before. Um, no work within any resource area other than bordering land subject to flooding is allowed. Um, the pre-construction conditions describe how you'll contact us a few days before to uh, meet on site and look at the erosion controls, look at the DEP sign and find out who is going to be working uh, on your project and provide evidence that the order has been uh, recorded at the Registry of Deeds and that, um, that your bond is paid. And under erosion controls, I had just left this part highlighted in green in this one rather than the bylaw, which was saying about the compost tubes rather than the wattles that are in your plan. So, yep. Eileen, yes. uh, just a quick one. The yes. purpose of the green highlighting is what? Uh, is to just tell uh, Drew and everybody else that his, th their plans had, had called for a straw wattle. Right. But uh, we're just saying that compost tubes or maybe hay bales are better under the circumstances because it's mostly going to be on impervious surface and right. a straw wattle just isn't it's how do you, it's hard right. to hard to pin down that's why especially it was to stake them into concrete or right <laughs> I mean, that might be a problem whereas the compost tubes are just heavy. heavier 
they just kind of they'll just sit there. Okay, and, and, and you have green throughout a few other places. That was just it, and those are just highlighted to just point out, but okay. there's nothing wrong with them. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know why. why that's fair, the, that's a, that's a fair question. And, and just as I suspected, the highlighting in one place means something different than the other place. Probably. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, and then the rest of these are standard ones about how you have to um, you know, stabilize the, the areas immediately and no dewatering is permitted unless we approve a dewatering plan, um, keep the area clean, uh, we reserve the right to install additional erosion controls. The pollution control um, conditions are all standard about um, no discharge of, of fluid and if one happens you report it, um, no equipment or refueling um, you know, within a certain distance of um, resource areas. Uh, no pesticides, herbicides, fungicides shall be used within 100 feet of wetlands unless otherwise approved. And then under drainage and stormwater management conditions, we're asking that the installation of this catch basins and of the compensatory flood storage area be witnessed by a PE. And that um, the stormwater management system shall be maintained in accordance with the O&M plan submitted as part of this report. And the little part that's in green is just because our standard condition in the past just asked for the name and the contact information and a copy <coughs> of the contracts, whereas um, we're trying to get into the habit of actually asking people for an inspection report or a, some kind of a maintenance um, demonstration that, 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 they're, that they're keeping things clean. So that's why that's just highlighted just for today. Um, no invasive species shall be planted anywhere in Burlington. And then... Um, for the COC, this just describes what is needed, and this is green because, oh, I was just highlighting that the as-built plans sh must include the compensatory flood storage area. That, that's all. Um, and that's it. Okay. Very good. All right. So, sir, do you have any questions at this point? Are you no. all set? I am all set. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, are there any changes from the commission on the right or on the left? Anybody need anything else on this one? <coughs> but it looked pretty complete, I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, in that case, let's move forward. Could I have a motion to close the hearing on uh, DEP file number 122-694? Uh, <coughs> so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? That's a 600. Zero, zero. Could I have a motion to approve the findings under Burlington Bylaw Article 14 uh, for uh, <coughs> 168 Middlesex Turnpike, DEP file number 122-694? That was just closed, yeah. Motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Same vote? No. Six. Abstain. You abstain. Okay. It's 501. Okay. Uh, could I have a motion? Uh, to approve the order of conditions under both Burlington Bylaw Article 14 and the State Wetlands Protection Act for uh, uh, DEP file number 122-694. So move. Second. Second. All in favor? 501. All right. And could I have the requirement to post $500 surety under authority of Burlington Bylaw? $5,000 surety under Burlington Bylaw Article 14 for 168 Middlesex Turnpike for DEP file number 122-694. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on the amount? All in favor? 5-0. Okay. <coughs> I think you're all set. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you all. very much for a good all night. your effort. I appreciate it. All right. You take care. So I guess the next is planning board comments. We're going to send comments to the planning board saying that all the requirements that we asked for have been met by the applicant at 36 Cambridge Street. Correct. Yep. Is there anything else we need to talk to uh, the planning board about? Um, one nine, yeah, 168 Middlesex as well. We'll tell them we should. 
Yeah. Tell them that we issued. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, subcommittee and staff reports. Is there anything uh, to report in that area? Any update on the beavers? Where? Uh, that was completed, I think, the last time. Yeah, that's, as far as I know, that's resolved. At which, 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 what is Rahanas it? Park, there, there were beavers, there was beaver dam at Rahanas Park, which was flooding the um, properties on Susan Ave, and, um, also on Dolores. Dolores Drive. And how was it resolved? Um, the beavers were trapped by the town, and, um, and then the town utilized eastern Middlesex mosquito control to actually break up the dam. And so it's, it's resolved? For now. Until they build back. There will be beavers again. They, yeah. they will be back. We'll be counting yeah. on it. All right. All right, so that takes care of the beavers. Anything else on subcommittee and staff reports? All right. Other in business, we have something listed as enforcement order, 10 Spring Valley Road. Um, do we have someone here for that? We do. Conservation, yeah, come on up. Have a seat. Thank you. We're, we're very friendly. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so why, why, don't, why don't you uh, just tell us your name and where you live? Uh, my name is Doug Raboyne. I live at 10 Spring Valley Road in Burlington. All right. Glad and I lived there for like 40 today. years. All right. All right. So let's see what uh, John or Aileen, you want to tell us what's going on here? Well, I'll start. Um, so Mr. Boyne came in to talk to us in August about how he wanted to cut some trees at the back of his yard. And <clears throat> I told him and I followed up with an email to say that he would have to file at least an RDA to, to do so because it's in the riverfront area it's, uh, and it's also in, in flood zone. And then we got a call a couple of weeks ago now to say that somebody was cutting trees at 10 Spring Valley Road and when I went there, um, a lot, how many trees? And now I can't remember now, seven or eight trees had been taken down and um, he hadn't come to us for permission. So uh, we issued an enforcement order and said, Come in, have a chat, and let's talk to the commission about this. Okay. I'll just Did, I'll just share share the uh, pic, some some pictures. You have some pictures? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So well, this this is just a, a picture of uh, of the yard. The I actually have a I have a better one, which I'll show you in a second, which, which shows where the stream is and the trees that were cut were were back here behind this, uh, this bush and close to the, the shed. And this is, at the bottom, we just have some pictures of, the, of the, the, the trees that were down. Okay. All right, and the resource area involved is what? Um, inner river, inner riparian, inner riverfront. Inner riparian, and how close were the, was the cutting to the? Um, it may have been something like 30 feet, but I haven't gone back to, I didn't go back to measure because I, um, I didn't go back to measure. I haven't been back out on, to his property. Oh, okay. All right. And would you like to make any comment now? Maybe it's appropriate for you to say something. Yes. Um, sure. I'm not a tree hater. Uh, I have pictures. I have 14 trees in my, my backyard. Yeah. that I planted uh, this year and last year. <clears throat> They're new trees. And <clears throat> just want you to know I don't hate trees. It's just I've watched so these trees. So you planted 14 trees recently? I planted 14 trees. Okay, around the house and so forth and so forth? Yeah. May I show you these? Of course. Oh, come on, sure. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Okay, so why don't we go two in this direction, then we'll change. How's that? There are trees planted. Okay. That's a lot of trees. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm curious, sir. You, so you, you started, you didn't have a permit. You started, you took the trees down, uh, and you have been planting trees. 
Okay. Uh, why why did you take those trees down out of curiosity? What was your reasoning? They were dead trees, sir. <clears throat> they were the the bark was off of them. They weren't producing any uh, leaves, and they were leaning. So I thought they were danger, and therefore I thought I'd cut them down. And there's also one still there that has about a 20-foot branch that's dead and no, no, no bark on it. And the tree's limbs are all bare as well. Mm. And just something that's just so plain and obvious that they're dead that I just thought they should be cut down because they're dangerous. There's 75, 80-foot trees. If they fall, they're going to they're gonna break fences, interfere with a pool. So yeah, what you're saying is they were diseased or damaged in some shape. Absolutely, shape. sir. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, I mean, I think just so you know that we often get people that want to take trees down, and often the reason is exactly what you say. And when that's verified, we often do give permission to take them down sure. if, if they're in that bad of shape. I mean, we don't, we don't usually deny people that have split trees or rotting trees or dead trees. We don't normally deny them the permission to remove them. So having stated that, let's, let's see what else we have to do here. <coughs> in that, yeah, I understand it costs money to go before the commission. It costs $250 a month, or $250 to go before the commission to ask them to have the trees cut down. And then there's another commission, a state commission, or just one commission? Just the one. One commission, $250. Is that what it costs? If it's an RDA, what does it cost? Well, it does end up being close to that because it would be $50 for the RDA itself, and then there's the, uh, the legal ad cost between 150 and $200. So it's a total sum cost of 250 it's to cost. get before us. I'm 80 years old, and that's like half my uh, Social Security check, so. Oh, okay. I, and I, I'm going to pay for the trees to cut down. I do so, understand. Okay. So. All right. All right. So I, it, I think, so John and Eileen, we have an inner riparian zone, and the question <coughs> that the commission usually considers in the circumstance is what needs to be done so that some functional shade, if it's useful, has to be done to create that. Uh, and um, how would you recommend proceeding with this? Do you have a, do you, either of you have a suggestion? So, so I suggested that we drafted it, the enforcement order just to instruct uh, the owner to come in to a conservation meeting um, so that you could talk to him and then schedule a site visit with his permission, with him present, so the commission can walk the site and then make a determination, look at the site, determine where additional trees should be planted. Um, it looks to me, I can't, from those photos, it looks like those might be fruit trees or something, and they're up close to the house and probably would not benefit the brook at all. So I think you should do a site visit and make a determination after a site visit. Um, obviously nothing could be planned to now until next year anyway so okay so um, just so you know uh, we we are obligated by state regulation and our local bylaw to protect a resource <clears throat> area called the riverfront area the riverfront area is an area that's vegetated that works next to the stream and has to be and should be kept shaded because it benefits any animals or wildlife that use it and so forth, and it has other things that it does as well. So what John is proposing is that the commission come out and do a site visit. We look at what you have so far, and then we talk to you about if we think anything more is needed. Okay? okay. Uh, and as he said, no, even if we ask for some extra planting near the brook or whatever, nothing would be done because we're out of season for it anyway. So it would be, be not until at least springtime. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's, let's, see what, uh, other, let's see what the other people have to say. Okay. Uh, Ed, you have anything you want to say on this one? No, should we ask if a lot of the stuff that I see in the center there was some of the other pictures showed cuttings. Should, should he try to move, remove those so it gives us a better idea? 
uh, I would suggest we don't ask them to do anything until we probably go for a site visit. I mean, I just think we have to look at the situation, you know, if there's a, if there's a fence and how much shade is there and so forth. I don't think we should leap to asking for anything at this point. If, if there are logs there, then we can look at the logs and see if the trees really look dead just from the logs. Good point. You know. Yep. Yeah. All right, uh, Sarah. Can we go back to the picture of the cut down stuff? That's what that was still in my mind. <laughs> that. I mean, my I'm not an expert at all on trees, but it, the picture on the left side, that trunk doesn't have any heartwood decay or anything I would I don't know it's not totally obvious to me they were all dead and diseased I mean I, I'm also looking at the overhead view in Google Maps and it looks like a green area along the brooks but I mean you you live there you obviously know better than I what their condition was I would say it looks great that you planted all those trees I, I love all the fruit especially if they're fruit trees that's really awesome, but I guess it doesn't address the issue of is the brook properly shaded. So I think looking at the site would be necessary to draw any I also conclusions. Planted all the trees behind the road and den rooms and all those trees, I also planted those years yeah, ago. I can tell you don't hate trees. That's, that's clear. Um, <laughs> that's great. Uh, I guess I just want to look at it and see, like, is there anything that should be done here to make the, it more shady where it needs to be shady? That's my conclusion. To be fair, definitely, like this tree here, you can see that it... There is debt. There There's is damage in the center. Yeah. It's just it wasn't clear to me that they all were. Yeah. So we'll but look. We'll, we'll look at it and see what we think. And uh, the issue is what needs to be done to restore the area so it has some reasonable shade and so forth. Okay. So uh, Bill, do you have anything on this? No. Not, I'd like to go see the site. Uh, Indra, anything? No. You say it needs to be restored. Okay, Rob. Um. No, I think I think it's a good sort of suggestion to you know to take a look at. I, I think um, Sawmill Brooks, one of these that if you you know if something could impact uh, like all that Spring Valley Road, you know it goes through everyone's backyard. So it's sort of a good thing to sort okay. of. Okay, so uh, I guess what we'll do. Not that we can't do anything more tonight. We just wanted to talk with you, Thank uh, you. and. Uh, I think what we need to go in is have a site visit. The office will call you to schedule a time that's convenient for everyone, and we'll just go out and take a look, uh, and uh, then we'll go from there, okay? And, uh, um, and I guess we're not asking you to do anything at this point. By the way, I pull your thing the top of those trees so the roots will stay longer and be like 20 years before they die. That's a polyurethane. So how, how long have you been in Burlington, sir? I lived here 40 years. 40 years, that's a long time. Sure is. Yeah, a lot of changes, okay. So the next the commission's next meeting is on December 14th, so most likely the site visit would be in a month on December 13th. They usually go the day before the meeting. So we, we'll, we'll let you know, but it'll probably be December 13th. Which is a Wednesday? Okay. Yeah. Um, unless we get a snowstorm or something, and, and then in which case we'd probably just postpone it, <laughs> yeah, true. Um, which is totally possible in mid-December. We, um, we could get snow, that's we, right. We want to look at it when the ground is better. Right, right. Okay, so if the weather's okay, we'll see you on the December 13th. We'll walk around and see what we have there. And uh, then uh, uh, we'll ask you to come back for a subsequent meeting. How's that sound? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for coming in. Appreciate your time. Do you want your photographs right. back? Excuse me? Do you want your photographs back? Or, or will we keep them for, for the file? I look out my window. I see them all the time. <laughs> OK. <laughs> True. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll put them. I'll Thank get to. Have I'll a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next uh, we have a discussion and vote, uh, potential vote, for the Conservation Commission's <coughs> preference of location options for the new Fox Hill School. I'd like to call on Commissioner Bill Boyman, who has taken the, uh, the point on this to, to uh, keep abreast of what is going on. So, Bill? Okay, I'm going to ask to share my screen to just show with a layout for the two uh, possible locations for the school. 
the school started, the project started uh, with eight alternatives that could have been developed on this site or on the Pine Glen site. Everything from leave it alone to renovate to put two schools on one site, put two schools on the other site. And that after a process of elimination and much debate, they finally settled on one school, just replace Fox Hill at the Fox Hill location. Oh. Um, Sorry, we, apparently we had to give you permission. I okay. didn't. And currently it's down to four options, all on the Fox Hill School location. Two different locations and either two-story or three-story building. Um, so what I'm thinking is that, let me uh, share my screen, share, boom, boom, and then go find my drawings, which are here, and where's the other one? Get out of my way, there we go. There and here. Okay. Um, so. These are the two possible locations. The existing school is somewhere right about in here. It doesn't show it on this drawing. But the finished product would look like this with either option 3D, which puts it on the north side of the property. This is Fox Hill Road coming in here, and immediately the school would be there. And the vernal pool, uh, that I think is the most uh, important resource area on the site, is here, and it shows our 100-foot definition of a vernal pool and then there's a hundred foot buffer beyond that and they've made an effort in every drawing and every option to completely stay outside of that 200 foot area around the uh, the vernal pool uh, and they're very very much into protecting the other wet wetland resources which are up in these areas here there's one over here which will not be a factor at all in this either project what i the reason i asked to have this discussion is that I think there's a preferential location, which would be the 3C location, and I'm going to go over some reasons why. And if the commission agrees with that, then I think we should send a letter to the school building committee just saying we think there is a preference for the following reasons. Uh, and I have drafted such a letter, which I'll go over right now. Uh, keep in mind that when these buildings are in place, they're also talking about some... Um, ballparks or ball fields, two softball fields and a soccer field. And in this version, there's two softball fields and a soccer field much closer, actually physically abutting that 200 foot uh, buffer zone to the vernal pool. So one of my concerns is that in this arrangement, there is a much greater likelihood of foul balls, home runs, spectators, trash, you know, other things that could be ending up in the vernal pool area. And um, whereas this, this particular setup, the school itself acts as an additional buffer to the vernal pool. It's much harder to have, you know, balls or, or, or trash or anything else. They are talking about a couple of small playgrounds behind the school for the preschool age type kids, but I think that's much less of a threat to the vernal pool than a whole major uh, playground. So let me go over with the letter itself is here. Oh, I don't know why it came out in black. I hate that. Uh, it's nighttime and it's it, it needs to be changed. But anyways, uh, let me see. View. I thought I saw switch windows. Boom. Nope. I saw something. Here. Switch mode. There it is. Okay. So, I don't know if you can read it, but I'll read it to you. This is the, what I drafted to the Elementary School Building Committee. The Burlington Conservation Commission, CONCOM, would like to weigh in on the discussion for location of the new Fox Hill Elementary School. As you are aware, there are several wetland resource areas on the Fox Hill School property, the most significant of which is a vernal pool. Protection of that pool is a high priority. The CONCOM feels that the south location for the new school, the location 3C, would be a better choice for protecting the vernal pool for the following reasons. 
Of the four wetland areas identified on the site, the vernal pool was by far the most important and the most sensitive. This may very well be the largest vernal pool in Burlington and it deserves maximum protection. Having the building at option 3D, the further away from the vernal pool option, would have the softball and soccer fields directly abutting the vernal pool buffer zone limit. Foul balls, home runs, misplaced soccer balls, spectators, and even trash could all easily intrude into the buffer and to the protected resource area. Mowing and fertilization of the fields could easily encroach into the vernal pool and its buffer zone. It would be better to keep that further away from the vernal pool. We're obviously going to maintain the fields at short grass level. Um, and it would be pretty hard to just keep them from mowing beyond the, the line. With a school at Site 3C, the small area behind the school could perhaps be more naturalized, featuring walkways, trees, shrubs, native grasses next to the planned play areas rather than mowed grass and potential lawn chemicals. Again, for little kids that are going to be playing there. Currently, there is no information as to whether the fields will be lighted. However, it is highly likely that at some point someone will want to light them. Bright artificial lights would be extremely detrimental to the vernal pool amphibian species that are quite nocturnal, especially during the breeding season. The CONCOM would be very unlikely to approve any external lighting near to the vernal pool. With the school at location 3C, the lighting of the fields could remain as an option as the building itself would shield the vernal pools from the lights of the fields. Uh, this is personal experience that I've seen. Evidence of off-road vehicles, full wheelers, snowmobiles, dirt bikes has often been seen on the fields surrounding the existing school. Having the school at 3C might reduce such an intrusion from the vernal pool area. And so far there's been no indications that one site would cost any more than the other. Thus, location 3C, the building itself would act as an additional buffer to the vernal pool. Um, and then if you remember in the two drawings, uh, let me go back to them just for a minute. To, do I still have them up here? Two, 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 two. Yes. This version, the driveway, comes in <coughs> you know, from, from Fox Hill and from uh, Westwood right to the school. And the, 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 drive, the, the school bus and the cars are go around this way. In this version, there's a much longer drive that's required to get all the way around to the front of the school. So, um, and I heard some comments at the, some of the meetings that that's more impervious area, which may not be beneficial to the site. But what I'm saying here, um, although siting at 3C closest to the vernal pool may require greater impervious roadway surface, all the runoff would, from that roadway would receive some treatment, end up remaining on the site anyways. That whole driveway is not going to drain out to the street. It's all going to be in some catch basins, and they would have... Uh, you know, uh, sumps, and that would be end up in the in the same staying on site. Uh, although both options so impact into the hundred foot buffers to the two smaller wetland areas, and that's up along this part here. There's two. There's one wetland. There's another, and they are within the hundred foot buffer in both in both <laughs> cases. This this up here. There's a little bit of in, into that area. So although uh, they would both uh, show some impact on the 100-foot buffers. Both options are designed to stay beyond the 50-foot no-build zone to those areas. <clears throat> so those were my reasons for s suggesting that we endorse this location 3C for the location of the building. And I'm addressing another concern here. Another concern of the CONCOM is that the potential capturing of rooftop water for non-potable uses in the school building. There is a discussion of that that is beginning to be uh, happening where they would capture the rooftop water and use it to help flush toilets and save water. Uh, normally, if this wasn't on a wetland area, I would say that's a great idea. But here, that means rooftop water is now being taken off the site and ex you know, expelled into the sewer system. So it would not be then available to feed the vernal pools or the other wetland areas. So I'm saying that by the wording I'm using is another concern of the CONCOM is the potential capturing of rooftop water for non-potable uses in the school building that would result in rooftop water leaving the site via the sewer system. That could lead to a reduction in groundwater and possibly affect the hydrology that supports the wetland areas and the vernal pool. 
we recommend a wetland hydrologist be consulted before any decision is made to capture and divert rooftop runoff. Uh, the, Fox, the Burlington Conservation Commission recommend, recommends the site designated as 3C for the location of the new Fox Hill Building School. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the, the reasons I came up with. If anybody can think of any other reasons, I'd certainly like to hear them. Um, there is one other reason which I don't think we need to take a position on, but I think some neighbors might agree, and that would be in, in this plan, these two ball fields are much closer to the back of the residential properties. And if they were ever lit, you know, and there was nighttime playing, I mean, it would be much more disruptive to these houses than this setup would be. Uh, I may mention that in words when I describe it, but I don't think it's part of our letter. It doesn't really come under the con con cons uh, concerns. Uh, another thing that I think I, I already mentioned to them as a resident was right now, it doesn't really show. I think I have it. I have it here. Do I have it here? Yes. Here's the existing Fox Hill School. This is the Vernal Pool. The new building would go somewhere across here. There have been concer some concerns expressed to me as a town meeting member for this precinct that people like to take this path and go into the conservation area during the day, sometimes when school is in session. Some people have work at home or work three days or whatever. And they have been approached by building school people, personnel, saying, don't come in here when the kids are out playing. And school days now go from 8 a.m. even earlier, I think 7.30 or something, to 5 p.m. So that's quite a block of time when they sometimes are being challenged about walking to the uh, to the natural area that they feel they're entitled to as taxpayers who help pay to protect it. So I may bring up the concept that this is the path that goes through there. Whoops, it goes through there now. Uh, the school property includes this whole area behind Vincent Road. I think they could easily put a walking path from Vincent Road and connect there. And then anybody that wanted to walk their dogs or themselves, you know, from this area, instead of going this way to get to the path, could just go down this way and get to the path. Um, it may raise hell with people in this area who are already screaming they don't want any connection through here. There was a, these people were afraid that they might take and put a road through here and come out this way. That would drastically change that dead end street. You know, could they help the traffic flow and keep it in a circle or whatever. But I don't think a pedestrian pathway would be any great disturbance there. Um, so anyways, those are the things that um, I think do pertain somewhat to us in All that, right. that so, area. So let me first ask yes. the commission and staff, does anybody have any questions of Bill at all before we discuss the merits of this? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Please. Uh, you, first of all, you explained very nicely. I liked it very nicely done. Okay. My question, you said that um, behind the school, which is in front of the Ronald Pool, mm -hmm. there would be children playground? Yes, they're talking about putting small play areas for the youngest students. And that those children will be guided by the uh, teachers? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They're okay. Always. Okay. They, they, during right. school hours, the kids are not out there without supervision. And the number two is, do you think that they will put some sort of fencing? I don't know. Would we require a fence along the, the, the yeah, area? I think, I think if this was the situation, that the 3D location, mm -hmm. I would almost you know, ask for us to endorse a fence along there. I see. Uh, but I'm not, I haven't heard anybody mention anything about that in the plan so far. Okay. I don't think they're at that level. Um, all right. I, I thought, like, you know, if no, they put the fencing but, there. But you will have a, they'll file a notice of intent with the Conservation Commission, so um, you certainly have a chance to I see. Okay. decide whether or not you wanted to require it. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, Rob, any questions for Bill? Um, are there any sort of, um, I mean, just for myself, are there any sort of differences in what would be like a stormwater mitigation for the if the the building is closer to Vincent Road, or is that something that would be handled in the sort of construction plan? Well, I mean, again, it depends on what they're going to do with the rooftop runoff. The stormwater mitigation is going to be for the impervious areas, uh, and both of the parking lots and drives in both cases would be captured and infiltrated. 
the rooftop, depends on what they're going to do with the rooftop. If they're not going to use it for flushing toilets, then it would also have to be infiltrated into the ground somehow. Um, and it wouldn't need to be treated because it's clean. They are going to have solar panels on the roof. They are going to have, um, what's the underground heating? I just, geothermal. Geothermal, just escaped me for a minute. Where is that going to be? All these red dots are geothermal wells. In and in this growing, it's here. Oh, okay. 80 wells required for geothermal heating of this building of this size. Wow. Um, there will be a discussion Monday's meeting about costs of the different options. So far, there has been no indication of any cost difference between the two sites. <coughs> so if there was a significant cost difference, if this for some reason was cheaper, then that would, of course, overlay some of the concerns that we have. There would be a debate about that. So far, I haven't seen anything like that. I've also not seen any real significant difference in cost between building a two-story or a three-story. And the plans, I sh there were other plans showing the three-story uh, buildings in these sites, and they really had very little difference in footprint for some reason. Uh, it's more about the layout inside the school and how things flow from students leaving and going and that type of thing. Uh, but they're going to do get more into the weeds on that on Monday's meeting to discuss uh, the internal workings of the school and two-story versus three-story, but they're not voting on that until the following Monday when they will vote on location and height of the two schools. Because that all has to be done by December to get the package into the state in order to get the funding rolling from the state. Can I just further address Rob's question? So, I mean, they won't design the drainage for you know for a long time, but I would I would expect that low impact development is is really consistent with the other things that they're trying to do in this school. I mean they're trying to make it a pretty green school, so I would imagine that they'll also use LID for their stormwater. Yeah. <coughs> you think they'd use rain gardens in a place with yeah, children if, running around? Yeah, well, if they're not, if they yeah, as long as they don't hold water. I mean, oh, no, it's a drain thing, like, so, yeah. like they did at the other. Uh, Memorial School, yeah, okay. That Memorial School though does hold water. It doesn't drain very significantly. It's not functioning the way it's, it's not functioning the way sure, it was intended. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I haven't seen any discussion the of that. School, there are, there middle are, school does. Yeah. yeah, yeah, All right, let's we'll keep going and then we'll go over to you folks as well. Uh, Sarah, no, I, any I, questions I, of Bill? No, no questions. Okay, and Ed, any questions of Bill? Uh, I pretty much addressed them with Bill. Already, and a traffic thing too, even though that's not our issue, but yeah, yeah. carbon monoxide is just sitting around on 3D. All right, John. John <laughs> I don't know, have you been to Fox Hill Road lately? It's almost all Tesla, so. <laughs> yeah, all right. So John, you have any comment one way or the other? No, I mean, I totally agree that, you, that um, the playing fields would be, the proximity of playing fields to the Vernal Pool would potentially be very detrimental with increased <coughs> unwanted foot traffic and activities from from um, people yeah, who just I, wouldn't I, respect the pool. It seems to me fields next to the Vernal Pool encourage people to be there. Yeah. yeah. And that is just simply not good. How about, strongly about, do you feel about lighting? Um, I mean, I think the fields are probably not going to be used during um, amphibian migration, which is like late March, early April. Those fields are probably going to be closed, you know, because they'll be too wet. So. Um, that's that's kind of the critical time for vernal pools. Mm -hmm. Like, um, but in general, you don't want to light up natural areas anyway. You know, it's not just the critters; it's owls. It's all kinds of things that you know. Okay. All right, Eileen. Should I just say nocturnal animals, not amphibians, or yeah, yeah. nocturnal yeah. animals, right? Uh, no, I actually, I, I, I'm inclined to agree with with Bill's and everybody else's. Um, um, leaning towards the, the school being closer to the vernal pool. Um, there's also the issue of potentially runoff, you know, from pesticides or whatever that, that are applied to playing fields or fertilizers, which I think is in Bill's letter. I just, we didn't really mention it tonight. And I'm in agreement too. Right. Uh, 3C is probably the better option if we have a vote. So uh, the only question I have, and I think we talked a little bit by email about this is if the school is closer to the vernal pool, it does act as a barrier and seems to have some benefits of not encouraging people to be behind there. Does it 
if the runoff, if the stormwater runoff is being diverted into the sanitary sewer, is that significant enough to affect the whole hydrology of the area compared to the whole area around it? What, do you have an opinion on that? I do not know. Um, to me, it just seems intuitive that you're taking water potentially away from the wetland by flushing it down the sewer. Um, and we would normally require a site to retain as much water as possible on site and certainly more than it had in the pre-design, in the, you know, the pre-development. Um, now, I don't know. It's outside the 200, though, right? Yeah, the but I'm just talking stormwater control. But, but the building is outside the 200. Yes, it which is. There'll be no impervious there. There's no impervious within the 200, correct, correct. But how much does... <coughs> The, the, the groundwater, you know, from the, the um, from the from the, the rain, feed the vernal pool. Uh, so, I don't know. Well, I, the school site I think is is at a lower elevation than the vernal pool, so it's completely possible that groundwater from the, the school location doesn't actually flow towards the vernal pool. The surface water. It's, it's hard to know. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes, but frequently. Groundwater flows in the same direction as surface water, not all the time. But they, they did say in their exploration so far of the site that the groundwater is much, there's much more groundwater at the uh, 3C location than there is at the 3D. So there is, you know, a very shallow two water, although they did say that would not cause them a problem in building. That makes sense. It's closer to the wetland. Sure. They're not concerned that they're going to need some pumps running all the time in the 3C location. I've walked around this area a lot, and there's some areas where you're just like squelch, squelch, squelch all times of the year. Again, I haven't seen the specifics of the design, but they had said it would not be a problem to develop them, even with the, the groundwater. I think during permitting, uh, another issue we should <coughs> think about is impact temporary, temporary impacts that could become permanent during construction. Because if they're within 200, how, how much further in, for the purposes of construction, do they have to disrupt that 200 feet? They have, it, they have got plans uh, already shown for intermediate. You know, this is intermediate. They're going to have parking here. And, you know, the, they have phase one, phase two, phase three, to the final phase, rough draft of what the construction would look like for each site. Nothing goes beyond any of that here. I think there might have been a little intrusion, intrusion into some of these ones up here uh, and, and then fixed afterwards, but um, they've really made, they're, they're very conscientious about the wetlands and protecting them. They realize that that's an important part. So they won't have to temporarily disturb the 200 foot? I've seen nothing ways. indicating that that would be the case. I see, okay. So one other thing. Um, if you look at the look at the school property, there's a lot of wooded area on the school property, and I think they've done a really good job and they've been sensitive to having all all the uh, alternatives within the area that's already developed, either with with grass, school, or or parking lot. Um, if you recall, five years ago we had an eight-year-old Elliot Parsons who came in and designed a nature trail mm -hmm. on um, the wooded portion to the north north part of the right, site. That's along. right up in here. Um, Yep, so they've, they've completely stayed out of that area. Um, Not well, completely. Just on, well, on one alternative, they're clipping a little portion of it. But. Yeah, and they're clipping a little bit of that in 3D, but on the other hand, they're clipping a little bit of these woods here in 3C. So one doesn't really have no tree cutting. Right. They both have a minimal amount of tree cutting that you can expect for a project of this magnitude. One of the concerns for the neighbors was along this border. They did not want to see a lot of tree cutting because that's their shield from yep. the school. Yeah. Yep. All right. So I, I, I feel that, uh, one, uh, thank you, Bill, for, for drafting this, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, I think you have made a very strong case for the 3C location. Okay. That's what it seems to me. Okay. And I, I think less people <clears throat> being present on a continuous basis in the area of the vernal pool only benefits the vernal pool. Okay. I mean, that's the way I see it. And then the next question would be, I mean, we'll just vote on whether it's okay to send this letter, would be to whom and from whom? You know, I mean, should, I'm going to say it's from the commission. Do you want me to include the staff from the commission and the staff, or should it just be the commission? Just the commission. Okay. 
and then I, I plan to send it to, uh, I have e email addresses for the entire school building committee and for four of the key development uh, people who have been showing up at all the meetings. Yeah, because of the fast timeline, I think they all should get it, it yeah. seems to me. No, Bill said they don't, they're meeting a week, they're voting a week from Monday. They're meeting Monday, but they've, they've moved the vote to the following week. But you want your letter for Monday? Yes, because they're going to discuss, oh. okay. you know, costs and features. Oh, well, we'll just, it's okay. We we'll just, can we, can we we're, get we're it out? Tomorrow. And, I'll, I'll, I'll scan that tonight and send it to you immediately. So we printed it. Uh, there was one, one little edit that I made. Like, um, oh, it was tiny. It was, uh, what was it? it was How from, tiny was it, I think? From and toward or something, the Vernal Pool. Uh, um, there was one thing that just... Uh, intrusion into the Vernal Pool instead of from the Vernal Pool. Okay. As option as instead of an option as. Just the teeniest little... Okay. And the way you have it written, there's two signatures. Larry's and Bill's for the chair, for the as okay. chair and co-chair, vice chair. All right. So, what is? Are you going to send it? No, I'll just send it. I was just going to scan it and send it to you with the signatures. Okay. Oh, or well, you can just take the original, actually. Yes, I can take the original. I can scan it and send it. Yep. Do you want us to sign something now, or you? Yeah, sign it now. Okay. And then I will take it home, scan it, and send it tomorrow. This small no, letter? No. no. They have all of this stuff. Yes. They, they look at that every week at the meetings. Okay. Do we want to take a vote on this? I think we should. Should we say that in the letter somewhere? That somewhere up front that the, has voted, you say it voted 3C would be a better choice. See, so voted if it's unanimous. It's probably better same. if he just, well, yeah, I'm just no, say I think, he could say it in his cover note. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, I don't want to change to it again. Blah, blah, blah. The yeah. soon just send it out. Well, so. it's on the first page. There's no signatures there. Um, that's true. That's true. Whatever. Do whatever you, well, that's whatever you want to okay. do. Okay. How's that? Yep. All right. Better. So could I have a motion that uh, mm -hmm. the, to show that the commission's strong preference for layout options is option 3C for the new Fox Hill school building? I'll move. Second. S second. Second. All those in favor? Six, zero, zero, unanimous. Great, thank you. you. Probably reference that somewhere. Yep. Okay. All right, Bill, again, thank you very much. Nice job putting yeah. all that together. Yeah, nice job. Definitely good. All right, so now we're at upcoming meetings, December 14th and January 11th. And what is that? Uh, is anything is else? Hearing none, could I have a motion to adjourn this meeting of the Burlington Conservation Commission? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Six zero zero. That was the fastest thing I ever got a motion tonight. <laughs> I think I won. <laughs> e motion in that motion. Yeah, that's right. All right. Have a good evening. I thought I was.